One of the joys of landscape painting, I think, is getting to know the history of the land, the people who lived here, and how they made their mark on it. The Deschutes River, for example, because it is the only water source that winds its way through this part of the high desert, has been important to everyone who's lived here. Native Americans, the Hunipui, who were part of the Northern Paiute peoples, migrated along the river for thousands of years, fishing, hunting, and gathering local roots, seeds, and nuts. When Lewis and Clark came through Northern Oregon in 1805, the Nez Perce told them the river was called Toranihiux, which means enemies, because they had been at war with the Paiutes for generations. For a few years, folks back east called it the Clark River, but that name didn't stick because French-Canadian fur traders had moved in, calling it the Riviere des Chutes, or River of the Falls. While all those people have faded into history, the river remains. Even as the town grows up around it, there is still plenty of time to study its moods, watch how the light plays across its surface, especially as the sun is setting. It's this somber mood at sunset that I want to capture in my next painting, which I'm going to call Deschutes Twilight. I've talked in previous episodes about how I work from photographs that I've taken myself, about how I compose the images in the camera as I go. I chose this one to paint because I really like the color scheme, these brilliant oranges set off by these deep blues. I also like how the clouds sweep around to the left, a shape picked up by these leafless branches, and then on through to the shoreline, creating an oval that draws your eye around the image. Yes, this will make a simple yet compelling painting. I've also talked about how I paint on sheets of masonite, which I coat with gesso and sand until the surface has the texture of an eggshell, and how I use graphite transfer paper to copy the image onto the masonite. I do this very quickly, not caring about details as much as broad shapes and forms. When complete, the painting often looks like this, a mass of squiggly lines that make no sense at all, which is perfect. And how I like to do an underpainting, which, like the drawing, doesn't focus on detail but on broad shapes and forms, this time defining all the areas of light and shadow. The underpainting is also done very quickly. In this case, it took about 90 minutes to complete, start to finish. Once the surface is completely dry, which takes just a couple of days, I'm ready to start on the final painting. This one is going to be fun. Also, as you've probably seen in previous episodes, you know I work with a very simple palette. Using cad yellow, phthalo blue, and cad red light, I can mix almost any color in the universe. Burnt Sienna and Portland Gray will give me my lighter cloud colors. And my base paints, Payne's Gray, Burnt Umber, and Titanium White, I use for almost everything. And, as always, my usual stable of double lot and really gnarly number two brushes. And my custom mixing medium and odorless turpentine, used for thinning paint and cleaning brushes. I start with the striking blue areas of the sky because it will be the dominant color that everything else will relate to. This is almost pure blue right out of the tube with a tiny bit of orange to gray it just a little and of course a little titanium white. I block it around the edges of the clouds without worrying too much about blending. I'll come in with a different color and do that later. As I work my way down, I add white to lighten it and by the time I reach the horizon, it is a very light blue. Then I use that same color and begin to blend around the clouds. Next, I mix white and a touch of burnt sienna and fill in all of the warm areas. By this point, because of the varnish I use in my medium, the blues are already starting to set, which is great, because I can use that same warm gray and really begin to blend these edges, giving them an authentic, wispy look. Once those are done, I jump down to the horizon and begin working on the warm colors. Mixing cad red, white, and burnt sienna, I get this orangish brown which contrasts nicely with the blues right next to it. Once I have a color mixed, I'll paint in all the areas that need it, the edges of the clouds behind the tree line here, as well as the warm reflections on the water. Adding more white, I also use it for the lowest part of the sky, adding cad yellow as I paint toward the middle where the sun is setting. This tiny strip of yellow that stretches all the way to the right side of the painting is so important even though it's such a small area, because it's at the center of that oval shape I mentioned earlier, and it will be the first thing your eye is drawn to. Next, I work on the darker parts of the clouds using a mix of Payne's Gray and Fallow Blue. For the clouds behind the tree line, I add a lot more blue because I love the way it provides contrast to these orange and yellow edges. 
I used that same bluish gray to fill in the darker parts of the water. Using the same hues and values for different parts of the painting helps give it a unified look and ties everything together. Then I jump back to my warm colors and begin to blend the edges of the larger clouds. While I usually like to work with just one color at a time, for a painting like this, I'll go back and forth between dark and light, warm and cool, because I want to make sure I'm keeping them balanced. It would be terrible to spend an hour painting all the warm colors, only to find out you needed more blue. So I use a balanced approach while painting. I use that same mix of burnt sienna and cad red light and begin some of the detail work, refining edges of these clouds on the horizon and adding ripples to the river's surface. Next, I mix the warmest color I'll use on this painting, cad yellow and white, and begin adding detail everywhere. I use it along the edges of the clouds on the horizon. I use it to blend between whites and oranges on the large clouds, and to add highlights to the wispy white clouds. Then I move back to a cool color, using almost pure Payne's gray to fill in the dark reflections on the water. When that's done, I'll let the painting sit for a day or so, so the water and sky can dry enough for me to begin on the real details. The trees along the horizon, and all the grass in the foreground. The next day, the painting has dried enough for me to go in and start working on the fine details. In previous episodes, I've talked about how I use double lot brushes to paint in trees and other background elements, about how I suggest branches, leaves, and other foliage without actually painting them. To me, the tree line is important because it gives the scene a sense of scale, and having these branches and treetops jut up into the sky past the horizon line helps tie the cloudscape to the riverbank below. If you look closely, you'll notice that there aren't any buildings or other man-made structures. I mentioned earlier that the city of Bend is growing up all around the Deschutes River. You can still find spots where you can't see houses or other signs of development, but it's getting harder and harder. And unless I'm painting something that is specifically about the buildings, like my old mill lights painting, I almost always cut them out. You could call me nostalgic, I suppose, for wanting to paint the river the way it might have looked 200 years ago, before the first white explorers made their way through the high desert, back when the Hunipui hunted and fished beneath these trees, or in these tall grasses along the riverbank. I can hear the splashing of fish and beaver, the distant bellowing of elk, the whisper of wind blowing through the grass and leaves. In previous episodes, I've talked about how I paint grass, again using a double op brush to paint detail where I have to, and then suggest the rest. Like the distant trees, the grass helps establish scale as we can see individual blades and plant stalks jutting upward from the bank, silhouetted against the river's surface. These have to be painted with painstaking care because our eye is going to be drawn to them. The rest can be painted quickly and roughly, using a variety of subtle colors and brush strokes. You can see how I use the underpainting to suggest areas of light and shadow, and I use those now to create different vertical planes as I work from the foreground to the edge of the river. Another reason I wanted to give the sky time to dry is so I could have a safety net while painting this tree. There's really no other way to paint branches like this. You just decide exactly where it's going to go, try to keep a steady hand, and pull the brush down, pressing harder as you go so that the branch gets thicker toward the bottom. If you mess up, the only thing you can really do is wipe it off and dry again. But with enough practice, you can learn to follow your photo source with few problems. I mentioned earlier that this small leafless tree is so important because it frames the left side of the painting, contributing to that oval shape that sweeps down from the clouds, helping to guide the viewer's eye to the riverbank and back around to the right. But again, like the trees in the distance, it also helps to provide a sense of scale. While the large tree in the background is a blurry mass of shapes, this tree in the foreground is crisply and tightly painted, to the point where you can even see small twigs indicating where leaves will grow in the coming spring. At this point, the painting is almost done, and I can go in and add the final details. Here, I've mixed a bit of cad yellow and cad red light to create this brilliant gold color, which I use very sparingly to add highlights everywhere to ripples, reflections, and the edges of clouds. The advantage of using a subdued palette for most of your painting is that when you do add a splash of color here and there, it really pops, and this gold looks amazing against the surrounding blues. Then, grabbing a new double op brush, I load up with titanium white and start adding details to the clouds. I use a lot of medium here, so the paint goes on thick, creating a subtle impasto effect. 
giving these wispy edges of clouds a lot of texture. The medium will help these areas dry much faster, as pure white paint can take weeks and weeks to dry. The last thing I add, as usual, is my signature. By this point, the grass has set up and is almost dry, so the paint goes on easily with a few simple strokes. Keep in mind that most modern frames overlap the painting surface by about a quarter inch on each side. I try to keep my signature, which is my brand, away from the edges by at least that much. And with that, the painting is done. I really like the way this one turned out. The palette is dramatic with these splashes of yellow and gold set against the brilliant blues and all these dark greens. And the composition is interesting and original with this oval shape that draws your eye around the image. As I predicted when I started, it was a lot of fun to paint, and I hope you had as much fun watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a note and consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.